Hi, thanks for clicking on this video. I'm Lonnie Hilton and I made this video with my husband, John. These are awesome chapters of Acts that you'll get to learn about. I really hope you'll enjoy them, especially learning about the early Christian woman. Please leave a comment and fill out the survey. There's a link in the description. Let us know if this is something that you like and you wanna see more of, especially for Book of Mormon year next year. Thanks and enjoy. Hi, I'm John Hilton. And I'm Lonnie Hilton. And we're excited to talk today about Acts chapter 16 through 21. Maybe we can introduce this with a story. Several years ago, we were hiking the Great Wall of China with my younger brother Cameron. And as we were going up and down the wall, it was an incredible day. There were not very many tourists around and it was just perfect. But towards the end of the day, we realized that if we weren't careful, we were gonna miss the bus. And I was kind of worried because there were some areas where we had climbed up the wall and I thought that climbing down would be a little dangerous. And when I looked off to the side, I saw what I thought was a shortcut. And I said, let's take the shortcut. Now Lonnie knew right away it was not a shortcut, but she was nice and she's like, okay, well, we'll do what John says. And we kind of followed along. And pretty soon we realized that we were in danger. We're slipping down the mountain and Lonnie's like, I will not go any further. So we walked back the way we came. Uh, we wound up hiking down. We did miss the bus, um, but don't worry, we survived. And as we were actually driving away from the area and could look back and see the bigger picture, we realized that actually we had been in danger. Um, it was definitely not a shortcut what I had picked out. We were just walking down the side of the, basically a cliff. And it was a reminder to me that sometimes it's good to look back and see a bigger picture. And so today as we start out studying these chapters, we'll begin with the big picture, an overview of Acts 16 through 21, and then we'll dive in deep and pick a few areas to explore more carefully. At the end of Acts 18, Paul and his missionary companion Silas were traveling throughout various regions to strengthen the church. At the beginning of Acts 16, they invited Timothy to join them in their missionary labors, and together they continued from town to town. At one point, Paul wanted to go preach the gospel in Turkey, but the Holy Ghost told them not to do it. Instead, Paul was inspired to head to Macedonia, a region in modern-day Greece. The first major city they visited was Philippi, as in the epistle to the Philippians. And they had some great success in Philippi. And from Philippi, they went to Thessalonica, as in First and Second Thessalonians. There, Paul taught about Jesus Christ, and many people believed his words. As is often the case, though, there was opposition. Jews who did not believe in Christ started protesting the Christians, saying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. I love that phrase, turn the world upside down. Our worlds and our lives can be completely changed as we come to Christ. You've probably seen that, how someone who comes to know Jesus Christ totally changes their life. Paul and his companions next went to Berea, where the people received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily. Another powerful phrase. They received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily. But the troublemakers from Thessalonica came to Berea, so Paul traveled to Athens. In Athens, Paul gave the discourse of an unknown God and then went to Corinth, as in the epistles 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Hopefully one of the things you're noticing is that several of the Pauline epistles stem from the journeys we're reading about in these chapters. So Paul stayed in Corinth for 18 months, preaching to many people and making friends in the community. Acts 18 describes an event where a leader of the synagogue complained to a Roman leader about Paul. This Roman leader was named Gallio. Interestingly, according to Roman historical records, Gallio ruled in this area from 51 to 52 AD. So this gives us a pretty good idea of when Acts 18 took place. In Acts 19, Paul traveled to Ephesus, a major Roman city in modern-day Turkey. As you've probably guessed, this is Ephesus as in the epistle to the Ephesians. An interesting account occurs at the beginning of Acts 19, where Paul found some disciples. Paul asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And Paul said unto them, unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Paul lived in Ephesus for more than two years and experienced some interesting things we'll come back to shortly. Then in Acts 20, Paul returned to many of the cities he had visited previously. A story I like concerns a young man named Eutychus. When the members gathered for a meeting, Paul preached past midnight and Eutychus fell asleep, and I probably would have too. Unfortunately for Eutychus though, he somehow fell out of a window and died. When I was a kid, I always thought the moral of the story was, don't fall asleep in church. But then again, Elder Uchtdorf said, Years ago, when I was serving as a state president in Frankfurt, Germany, a dear but unhappy sister approached me at the end of one of our state meetings. Isn't it terrible, she said. There must have been four or five people sound asleep during your talk. <laughs> I thought for a moment and answered, I'm pretty sure that church sleep is among the healthiest of all sleeps. <laughs> In Acts 21, Paul makes his way to Caesarea, which was the Roman capital of the province of Judea. Luke, who narrates the book of Acts, records, while we were staying there for several days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. He came to us and he took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands with it and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is the way the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns the belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. That's a pretty graphic object lesson. Luke continues, when we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Since he would not be persuaded, we remain silent except to say, the Lord's will be done. I'm so moved by the love the people had for Paul and for his determination to do whatever was necessary for Jesus Christ. Paul went to Jerusalem and while he was there, a riot took place where he was falsely accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple. Paul was arrested and this is how his journey towards Rome begins. But that's a story for us to explore next week when we head to Acts 22 through 28. For now, with our big picture view of Acts 16 to 21, we've seen Paul and his companions bravely tra traveling through Greece and Turkey, preaching the good news of Jesus Christ and having incredible success in spite of difficulties they faced. Let's now dive into four topics and dig a little deeper into what we can learn from these chapters. We'll explore the following topics. What do we really worship? Powerful female disciples of Christ, burning books and ships, and feeding the flock. Let's start by talking about what we really worship. In Acts 17, Paul preached to the people of Athens. He observed that the Athenians were very religious. As he walked through the city, he saw various objects of worship, including an altar with the inscription, to the unknown God. The Greeks had many gods they worshiped, and to cover their bases, they also even offered devotion to an unknown God, just in case there was someone they had missed. Paul taught the Athenians, and I love how he, he tries to connect with what they are worshiping to what he is hoping to point them to worship. He says, What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands. Indeed, he is not far from each one of us. Essentially, the Greeks were worshiping idols. And Paul says, Why are you worshiping objects of stone when we have a true and living God? Paul faced the same issue in Acts 19, while in Ephesus. After Paul had been preaching there for some time, a silversmith named Demetrius, a man who made his living building silver shrines of Artemis, or Diana, started a riot because of Paul. Demetrius gathered together other silver workers and said, Paul has drawn away a considerable number of people, not only in Ephesus, but in the entire region, by saying that gods made with hands are not gods. Keep in mind, there was a colossal temple dedicated to Diana in Ephesus. In fact, it was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Demetrius told his fellow workers that if Paul were allowed to continue, it would disgrace Diana and her temple. This started the riot where the people were full of wrath and cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! The protests were only stopped when the town clerk was able to settle everyone down. 
Now, to you and me, worshiping an unknown God or thinking of Diana as a real God sounds pretty silly. Would any of us be so foolish as to worship idols? But recently, I read a powerful book called Counterfeit Gods by Timothy Keller, and I realized that idolatry is a lot more relevant and prevalent than I thought it was. Keller writes, We may not physically kneel before the statue of Aphrodite, but many young women today are driven into depression and eating disorders by an obsessive concern over their body image. We may not actually burn incense to Artemis, but when money and career are raised to cosmic proportions, we perform a kind of child sacrifice, neglecting family and community to achieve a higher place in business and gain more wealth and prestige. A counterfeit God is anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. It can be family and children or career and making money or achievement. It can be a romantic relationship, peer approval, competence and skill, or secure and comfortable circumstances. An idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I'll feel my life has meaning. Then I'll know I have value. Then I'll feel significant and secure. Reading these words caused me to look inwards and really ask myself, what things am I tempted to worship? I love it how in both Acts 17 and Acts 19, Paul is so bold in calling out idolatry. Can we do the same with ourselves? Can we ask ourselves some tough questions? David Polison points out, questions bring some of people's idol systems to the surface. To who or what do you look for life-sustaining stability, security, and acceptance? What do you really want and expect out of life? What would really make you happy? What would make you an acceptable person? Where do you look for power and success? These questions or similar ones tease out whether we serve God or idols, whether we look for salvation from Christ or from false saviors. I love that the solution Paul offers isn't simply stop worshiping idols. He tells people to focus more on Jesus Christ. Paul tells the Athenians about how God raised Christ from the dead. He encouraged the Ephesians to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. And as Paul would later write to the Colossians, If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. So whatever idols you and I have, the solution isn't just focusing less on idols. It's focusing more on Jesus and receiving our joy and satisfaction and wholeness from Jesus rather than these other likely good things that could be idols. So let's pause for a minute and just kind of talk about how we see this as applying in our lives today. Um, Lonnie, what would you, I mean, I know you, you're not an idol worshiper. What would you say? How, how do you see the relevance of this principle in your life? Yeah, like the second commandment, you know, that we have this finger motion to know it's no graven images, like an antler of an animal, right? And that is pretty easy. I don't really bow down to, I don't have a temptation even to bow down to graven images. But I love that quote that we just read that counter, a counterfeit God is anything that we get our self-satisfaction from or sense of value from, even if it's a good thing. And so I can see that in my life, whether it's relationships that I have, if those are taken away, or achievements, um, knowing that, like the quote said, if that was taken away, then would, my, would, would I feel like, oh, there's no sense of living anymore, like I have no purpose living anymore because that's taken away? When obviously, like these things that are important relationships, obviously there would be some grief, there would be great grief, right, and a great sense of loss. But if I'm really focused on Jesus Christ, I would not, like I could, I could be focused on him and yes, I would, could have that loss, but not be like life needs to be over because of my faith in Jesus Christ and because I'm focused on him. So I think that is really valuable to like think about where I'm placing that value, where I'm placing that, sat where I'm getting satisfaction from and a sense of fulfillment from. Is all my fulfillment coming from my relationship with Jesus Christ? Obviously, 
that's what we want and that's what will help us and bless us the most. So I appreciate this kind of call to repentance from Paul, kind of wake up call like, no, we, we don't worship idols at all. We worship a true and living God who loves us and who we are his offspring. So we should really, really make sure we're 100% full on focused on him and worshiping him and not these other things. Yeah, I, and you mentioned relationships. I think that's a big one. For me, I also think about achievements. I tend to be a pretty task oriented. And so there have been times in my life when I've had some kind of big goal and I think, okay, as soon as I get this big goal, then I'll be happy. And then I achieve the big goal. And within 24 hours, I'm like, okay, what's the next thing? And I feel like if, if my happiness is rooted in something other than Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, I'm going to wind up feeling empty. Let's turn now to some powerful examples of early Christian women who fixed their focus on Jesus. I am so excited about this part to talk about these women in these chapters. In Acts chapter 16, we read about Paul's missionary efforts in Philippi, which was an important Roman colony in modern day Greece. In verse 13, we read, on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the woman who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. From this description, we know a lot about Lydia. It, is, it appears she was a successful businesswoman. And did you notice it doesn't say anything about her husband? It simply says she and her household. She's the boss. She's running things. After being baptized, she invites Paul and his companions to stay in her home. Lydia's home becomes a gathering place for the church in Philippi. Lydia had the means and unabashedly used them to further the work. I love the phrase that describes Lydia, whose heart the Lord had opened. I hope those words could be used to describe me. Lonnie, whose heart the Lord had opened. The fact that the Lord opened it means Lydia was humbly allowing the Lord to work in her and be taught and tutored by the Spirit. Not only is she showing humility, but she shows bravery too, which maybe comes from letting the Lord open her heart. Even after Paul and Silas were thrown into prison, Lydia still welcomed the believers in her home. In Acts 16, verse 40, we read, After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. I wonder if the brothers and sisters of the church were at her house to pray for Paul and Silas in prison or to encourage and teach one another because of all the opposition. Lydia had a home large enough to host a group of people and a heart big enough to love and support those new converts. What an example Lydia is of allowing the Lord to open her heart and do what was needed to build testimony and faith in her community. Let's remember and talk about Lydia. Well, now let's look at a woman named Priscilla. She is also sometimes called Prisca. In Acts chapter 18, verse 2, we learn that she and her husband, Achilla, lived in Corinth. Paul met them there and lived and worked with them for 18 months. We don't know all the details of what they did together, but when Paul left for Ephesus from Corinth, Priscilla and Achilla came with him. Paul left Ephesus, but Priscilla and Achilla stayed there to build up the church. And a missionary named Apollos came to Ephesus, and he started preaching of Jesus Christ. He was a really good preacher, but he didn't quite have all the details right. So in Acts chapter 18, verse 26, we read, When Priscilla and Achilla heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. Can you see Priscilla as a leader of the church? She's not on the sidelines. She's helping to establish correct teaching. Today, we might see Priscilla and Achilla as mission leaders, helping to strengthen the church wherever they are. She knew the gospel. It's likely some of the knowledge came as she hosted Paul in her Corinth home for a year and a half, so she could correct Apollos when he wasn't quite teaching the correct doctrine. She did this without flaunting her own status or knowledge, but taking Apollos aside privately. She shows a level of consecration in multiple ways. In Romans 16, Paul writes, Greet Prisca and Achilla, who work with me in Christ Jesus, and who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. What? All the churches of the Gentiles? Notice, too, that Paul mentions Priscilla first. You can see in Paul's words how much Priscilla and Achilla have done. 
They risk their life for Paul. They're giving all to support the work of the Lord. And Paul says that all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks to them, implying they've served in vast and far-reaching ways. And it's not surprising that verse 5 says, greet the church in their house, suggesting Priscilla and Aquila have opened up their home and are hosting church meetings. Lydia and Priscilla are obviously doing great work. Paul encountered other powerful female disciples of Jesus Christ. When Paul went to Thessalonica in Acts 17, we read that not a few of the leading women believed his words. So how many is not a few? Well, to me, it's another way of saying a lot. And then he traveled to Berea, where again, many believed his testimony, including not a few Greek women of high standing. So we have a lot of women believers in Thessalonica and a lot in Berea. And additionally, when Paul preaches in Athens, a woman named Damaris is specifically mentioned as one who clave unto Paul when he taught. I wasn't sure what the word clave meant, so I looked it up in the Blue Letter Bible, which is a tool that allows us to see how the original Greek words would have been defined. And one of the definitions for clave is to join or fasten firmly together. And I love to think of Damaris firmly joining herself with Jesus Christ as she learns of him through Paul. To me, it's significant that even though Damaris was in a culture enveloped in Greek mythology, statues, idols, Paul helped her raise her sights, and she totally left her old beliefs behind. Damaris's conversion is a witness of the power of the Spirit to confirm simple, pure truth. When Damaris heard Paul's teachings of a God who she did not know before, the Spirit could still witness the truth to her. So in Acts 16 to 20, we have a group of women, female converts in Philippi, Athens, Thessalonica, and Berea, and three named female converts, Lydia in Philippi, Damaris in Athens, and Priscilla in Corinth. And there are many additional influential female followers of Christ in the early Christian church that I want to mention here. For example, in Acts 21, Paul travels back toward Jerusalem and stops in Tyre. He gathers together the disciples, and we read that their wives and their children were with them. Paul stays with Philip, who had four unmarried daughters who were known to prophesy. And in the coming chapter, we will read about Paul's sister, whose son helps Paul escape. And in Romans, we read about Phoebe, who helped many people, including Paul. Paul even asked the saints to do whatever Phoebe needed them to do. We also learn of Mary of Rome, who labored much, Tryphena, Tryphosa, and Persis, who in Paul's words worked very hard for the Lord. We'll read about the mother of Rufus, who was a mother figure to Paul and others. The sister of Nerus, Julia, and Junia are also listed as fellow saints to give greetings to. Paul describes some of these individuals as of note among the apostles. In some of the smaller epistles, Paul calls out additional named women, Chloe in Corinth, who offers her home and leadership, and Santichi, who Paul refers to as laboring at his side. Claudia is a believer who sends her greetings to Timothy. Did you notice that only one of these women who we've talked about is mentioned with her husband? Only Priscilla. All the others are listed on their own. That may or may not mean that the others are single, but I appreciate the reminder that whether we're married or not married, we all can make a difference in building the church. At the beginning of our big picture overview, Timothy was named as a young man who helped Paul. How did Timothy get in a position where he could be a powerful Christian leader? After all, his father appears to be a Greek who did not believe in Jesus Christ. Well, in a later epistle, Paul writes to Timothy and he says these words, I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded is in thee also. One definition of unfeigned faith is real or true. Timothy doesn't have fake faith. He has real faith. Grandmother Lois and mother Eunice were great purveyors of faith and passed their faith on to their son and grandson Timothy. I wish we knew more about Lois and Eunice, but they remind us of the countless other mothers, grandmothers, and female disciples who further the work of the Lord in their own homes, teaching the gospel to children and grandchildren. That is a great work. So that's at least 19 faithful women that Paul knew and loved. Could we talk about these women more? I admit some of them have tricky names and I wish we knew more about them, but we do know they were faithful 
and they work to build the church. Hopefully sharing their stories and speaking their names can help us become more familiar with them and their discipleship. As I think about how this might relate to us today, I'm reminded of a talk President Nelson gave. He said, 36 years ago in 1979, President Spencer W. Kimball made a profound prophecy about the impact that covenant-keeping women would have on the future of the Lord's Church. He prophesied, Much of the major growth that is coming to the Church in the last days will come because many of the good women of the world will be drawn to the Church in large numbers. This will happen to the degree that the women of the Church reflect righteousness and articulateness in their lives, and to the degree that the women of the Church are seen as distinct and different in happy ways from the women of the world." Close quote. My dear sisters, you who are our vital associates during this winding up scene, the day that President Kimball foresaw is today. You are the women he foresaw. Your virtue, light, love, knowledge, courage, character, faith, and righteous lives will draw good women of the world along with their families to the Church in unprecedented numbers. President Nelson continued with the list of attributes righteous women need today. I want to read what President Nelson said, and in parentheses, I will list the names of some of these early Christian women who exemplify the trait President Nelson describes. Of course, this is not all-inclusive. There are many more women we could list. I'm mainly focusing on these early Christian women. He said, We need women who know how to make important things happen by their faith, Tryphosa and Tryphena, and who are courageous defenders of morality and families in a sin-sick world, Mary of Rome. We need women who are devoted to shepherding God's children along the covenant path toward exaltation, Lydia. Women who know how to receive personal revelation, Damaris. Women who know how to call upon the powers of heaven to protect and strengthen children and families, Lois and Eunice. Women who teach fearlessly, Priscilla. Attacks against the church, its doctrine, and our way of life are going to increase. Because of this, we need women who have a bedrock understanding of the doctrine of Christ, the women converts in Berea and Thessalonica, and help raise a sin-resistant generation, Paul's sister. We need women who can detect deception in all of its forms, Julia and Junia. We need women who know how to access the power that God makes available to covenant keepers, Yudia and Sintichi who express their beliefs with confidence and charity. Claudia, Phoebe, Chloe, we need women who have the courage and vision of our mother Eve, Rufus's mother and Persis. When I was younger, I felt a little sad that there were not more scriptural women I could look to for an example. Apparently, I did not know about the women who followed Jesus during his lifetime or these early Christian women. There are so many female followers of Jesus Christ we can look to for examples of what devoted, covenant-keeping, faithful women looked like anciently. They are hard-working, bold, knowledgeable, missionary-minded women who know how to receive and act on revelation. I want to be a devoted disciple like they are. I do too. Um, and these women are powerful. And Lenny, I love how you brought them together so we can see their strength both collectively and individually. I want to introduce our next topic with the story. Legend has it that during the Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire, Hernán Cortés was trying to capture the Aztec capital and ordered his own ships to be burned so his men had to take enemy ships if they wanted to return home. In other words, by getting rid of the ships, retreat was no longer a possibility. His actions proved effective and he captured the city. Similar stories are told about ancient Chinese, Greeks, and Vikings. And I was telling these stories to a friend and he said, it's stupid to burn your boat. What if you need it later? And that's a good point. Sometimes you shouldn't burn the ships. But in these specific instances, completely destroying the ships gave people the motivation they needed to move forward. Sometimes you need to burn the ships. 
As I thought more about this idea of burning the ships, I realized that there are several scriptural examples of this phenomenon. The anti-Nephi-Lehi's buried their weapons deep in the earth so they wouldn't be tempted to use them again. And a similar story happened while Paul was in Ephesus. Paul preached the gospel to a group of people who practiced magical arts, something like witchcraft. Many of those people believed Paul's words and decided to, metaphorically speaking, burn the ships. We read that they collected their books and burned them publicly. When the value of these books was calculated, it was found to come to 50,000 silver coins. Some have suggested that a silver coin was one day's wage. So if you say a person earns $25 an hour, that would make a silver coin worth $200, and 50,000 coins worth $1 million. But these people didn't sell their books on eBay or take them to Goodwill to get a tax write-off. They burned them. What was the result of cutting off the source of their sin? I love this. We read, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. I love that. They showed their commitment by burning the books. Metaphorically speaking, sometimes we have to burn the books, bury the swords, or burn the ships. So I wonder, what do you think that looks like? when in the world today, burning the books. Um, so I have a, a, an unfortunate story with this. I hope that no one will judge me at all. Um, but several years ago when, but this is way before the days of YouTube or Netflix, back in these days, if you wanted to watch something, you would watch it on a DVD or a video cassette. So it was during Christmas time and my brother and I were on eBay and we found that you could buy the complete selection, the, all the seasons, there were several seasons of this one TV show that we both liked. And you could get all of them for about $40. And I knew that there was something fishy about this because usually just one season alone would cost $40. But we like did it and it turned out that we got some pirated DVDs in the mail. And we made things worse by making a copy of them. So I had a copy, my brother had a copy, and I went back to Florida where we were living at the time and was just kind of enjoying my pirated DVDs. And about this time I was preparing to give a talk and one of the scriptures I was going to quote was from Alma 27, which is describing the converts of Ammon. And it says they were perfectly honest. So when I, when I heard that phrase and I was like re practicing the talk, reading it out loud to myself, the Holy Ghost said to me, John, is what you're doing with those DVDs perfectly honest? And I thought to myself, it's not. So my first thought was, I'm going to take that verse out of my talk. And then I felt kind of guilty because I was like, I'm changing my talk to fit my life. It seems like I should be changing my life to fit the scriptures. So in a moment of strength, I burned the ships or burned the book, so to speak. I took the DVDs and I just threw them into the neighborhood dumpster. And that was the end of it. Except for a couple of months later, I was like, oh man, I really miss those DVDs. And so I called my brother thinking maybe I could make another copy. I said, do you still have the DVDs? And he says, no, I felt guilty. I threw them away. And so because both of us had, metaphorically speaking, burned the ships or gotten rid of the books, we buried it deep in the earth, then all of a sudden I couldn't go back to my old ways. And so I think sometimes in our lives, we have to burn the ships. What do you think, Lonnie? How, how do you see this? Applying? Yeah, I see it like with the Ammonites. Is that right? They are the anti-Nephi-Lehi's who buried their swords deep in the earth. I, I think that really showed they really didn't want to do it, but they didn't even want to be tempted. Like at that moment, they really were converted, but they knew it'd be a temptation, so they buried it deep. And I think a good example of this is a college student who knew that it was a temptation for him to access inappropriate material on his phone. So he installed a filter that would keep him from accessing that on his phone and he gave the password to his roommate so that he wouldn't even have the password. And he said, roommate, don't ever give it to me, even if I beg for it, right? So that it was making it really difficult for him to give into this temptation. And I think sometimes that I, I think that's a way of really showing you're committed, but you know it's going to be hard, but you want to be committed. So you just have to burn it, burn the ships, burn the books so that you can, can't go to it. And so probably there's lots of ways that this could apply, right? It could be installing some kind of filter or throwing away old DVDs or getting rid of playlists. Maybe it's deeply, completely letting go of a grudge. Burning the ships might be a deep commitment to let go of an inappropriate desire or texting your bishop right now to set up an appointment to discuss some things you need to talk with him about. It could be deleting a specific app or playlist from your phone. 
It might be selling or getting rid of some possessions that are turning our hearts from God. To me, the ultimate example of burning the ships is Jesus. He had agency. And there had to be several times in the premortal life as well as his life on earth when he could have deviated from his divine mission, but he didn't. Sometime before the beginning, he determined what he would do and he did it. He never turned back. In Gethsemane, the Savior told Peter, put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Jesus had burned the ship. He wasn't looking back. And to me, this means Jesus can and will give us the strength to burn the ships in our own lives. So if there's a ship that you or I need to burn, I will let a match. So we began by zooming out and looking at a big overview of these six chapters, but now let's zoom in to just one verse in these chapters, and it's Acts chapter 20, verse 28. In context, Paul was bidding farewell to the leaders of the church in Ephesus. And remember, Paul had lived with them for more than two years. He loved them, he taught them, they were dear to them, and he knew he likely would never see them again. So these are some of his final words to them, and he said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. It's pretty cool how these few lines sum up the who, the how, the what, and the why we serve. So he says, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. So we're serving all the flock and we're looking out for ourselves too, but we're serving the flock. And he says, which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. So I love that because sometimes we might think about who we're assigned to minister to or who we have real responsibility of because of our roles or certain callings. But that's not what Paul's talking about. He says, who the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. And I love that reminder that this is the flock of Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost has, been, has made us overseers. To, why are we doing this? It's to feed the church of God. So I think about times in my life where the Holy Ghost has impressed me to do something that reach out to somebody, lo show love to somebody that maybe I wasn't assigned to be over or didn't have a responsibility over. And those can be some of the dearest experiences because it's driven by the Holy Ghost. And I love it that he says, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Just that reminder of the why, the whole reason why we're doing all this is because of Jesus Christ who gave his life for his flock. As I think about um, this verse, I'm reminded of a young men's leader who one night when I didn't show up to a young men's activity, he came and he knocked on my door. And I'm so impressed that, I mean, he didn't just call or back then we didn't have text messages, but you, it, it wasn't like a low effort. It was a big effort for him to come to my house, to knock on the door. And as I've reflected on that, I realized that when I'm just checking a box, it's a very different kind of service than if I realize, like you were saying, the Holy Ghost has given me this assignment, whether it's in my formal calling, or I love what Bonnie D. Parkin talked about, that we each have a personal ministry. And so where the Holy Ghost is just personally inspiring us to reach out to someone, I found that if I remember that Jesus Christ purchased this person's soul with his own blood, that that changes the way I view things. As we wrap up, I want to point out that everything that we've talked about today centers on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who will help us turn away from idolatry. Jesus Christ was at the center of these powerful female disciples and their worship. Jesus Christ is the one who helps us to burn the ships. And Jesus Christ is the one who has purchased all of us with his blood so that we can return back to the presence of our Heavenly Father. And to me, the example of these early converts is a reminder of the power of pure and simple doctrine of belief in Jesus Christ and what a difference that makes. And I testify of Jesus Christ and I testify of the spirit that comes when we testify of Jesus Christ, when we talk of him and that he and that testimony can really change our life and can change our focus and can change where we derive satisfaction and value as we were talking about with idolatry. And I'm so grateful for the example of Timothy and Paul and Silas and Damaris and Lydia and Priscilla. 
and all these others who were building the church because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And I just conclude with my testimony of Jesus Christ. I know that he lives, that he loves us. He strengthened all of these powerful people back in Acts chapter 16 through 21, and he'll strengthen us as well. Thank you.